there we go. One second, I have to wait till you starts. <laughs> it's always like, makes me very nervous that I messed something up. Alrighty, I think we are live. Okay, welcome to BIMS Dives. I'm Dr. Tierra Moore, founder and CEO of Black and Marine Science. And today we're diving into inclusion in ocean sciences with Dr. Ambrose Gerald. The first part of the conversation will be moderated by our Chief Relations Officer, Chris Howard, and our Chief Management Officer, Alex Troutman, will join us later. Dr. Ambrose Gerald is currently retired, but spent 38 years with the NOAA Northeast Fishery Science Center's Woods Hole Laboratory. During his career, he wrote the influential chapter on age determination in fisheries techniques and has conducted research worldwide. Along with serving as chief of the fishery biology section, chief of research planning and evaluation section, and chief of the research planning and coordination staff, he was the founding director for the Woods Hole Partnership Education Program. Dr. Gerald has also been a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion and has honestly made the path clear for us to be here today. We are so grateful for his leadership and excited to dive into inclusion in ocean science now. Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Right, thank you. And Dr. Gerald, like she said, thank you for joining us here today. <clears throat> and uh, just kind of, like I said, like she said, we just wanted to discuss inclusion in ocean science. So the first question we have for you is, how did you get involved in ocean sciences? Well, um, Chris, uh, as you can imagine, <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how I got in ocean sciences, I believe, uh, in terms of trying to encapsulate a long story, um, it has to do with my interest in science and uh, in biology, in life sciences, um, in the environment, um, uh, interested in evolution and natural history. Uh, and so it was a progression. I actually, as far as my graduate work was concerned, I studied freshwater environments uh, as far as aquatic sciences are concerned. In other words, my approach to um, uh, water uh, was limnological. Uh, in the uh, lakes and ponds and streams uh, and reservoirs of Oklahoma, where I did my uh, graduate work of both masters, both masters and PhD work. Uh, however, following my um, uh, PhD, uh, 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 winning my PhD and taking a job teaching at uh, Lincoln University as an assistant professor in biology, Lincoln University there in Pennsylvania, uh, the oldest uh, historically black college founded for um, uh, granting of degrees, uh, founded in uh, 1854. Uh, so at any rate, um, I uh, got an opportunity through the National Urban League um, to uh, do what I might uh, describe as a quasi postdoc, uh, where I uh, went out to California, to Livermore, California, which is not on the coast, <laughs> but yet where the uh, Lawrence Livermore laboratories are. And I was part of the uh, Berkeley Livermore um, uh, effort that was going on that was, my route was through the uh, National Urban League as a faculty member at a historically black college and university. And so when I got there, uh, the group that I had um, uh, agreed to and wanted to work with was a group that was looking at um, fisheries and marine science. So I worked in that particular laboratory 
with the uh, two uh, scientists, um, um, Dave Harris and Florence. Um, uh, geez, I'm drawing a blank on her right name right now. Name right now. But at any rate, um, my work was with Esox Mardix, the uh, anchovy. And I was looking at anchovy egg and larvae. And I was looking at uh, predator to prey relationships. I was looking at um, various aspects of their life history, but, uh, and then focused on what we were then referring to as a LD50 uh, experiment. Um, and so uh, at any rate, it afforded me the opportunity to um, go to the collection site where we would find them. And in this case, it was on a little area referred to as Raccoon Strait between Sausalito and the Golden Gate Bridge there on the uh, San Francisco Bay. And sometimes we would go uh, through over to Sausalito and um, go out to the experimental site or, or collection sites, or we would go to Richmond and et cetera. And while there, so working on that project, uh, which involved a uh, marine species, a marine environment, habitat, et cetera, I also got exposed to working with others in the lab who were working at Diablo Canyon along the coast of California. Uh, and then we also uh, got to do some work down in the Salton Sea, uh, down in the uh, Ontario Valley there, uh, or desert area. And, and so I followed the sun from an East Coast boy, born and raised uh, part of my life in um, Annapolis, Maryland, North Carolina, on my grandparents' farm, uh, to Oklahoma for graduate school. I did my undergraduate work in Maryland on the Delmarva Peninsula, which is surrounded by water, the Chesapeake Bay on one side and the Atlantic Ocean on the other, and lots of tributaries connecting the two or whatever. Uh, uh, uh. And so then out to Oklahoma, uh, to who would think, go to Oklahoma to uh, de deal with aquatics when that was a dust bowl at one time. But nevertheless, that is part of how I got started in marine science, but have always had a love for the biological sciences and for chemistry. Well, that's very exciting. I also started off uh, with aquatic uh, biology. I went to, I'm from the coast also in uh, Georgia and South Carolina okay. and went to landlocked Ohio to study uh, marine science. There was yeah. a lot of, you, <laughs> you know, aquatic biology there. Uh, there. Yeah. And uh, so Alex had, see Alex had joined us to the conversation. We just wrapped up the first question as you heard. Uh, sorry about the move on to the second. Uh, I know you mentioned working at Liberty, which, uh, which is a historically black college, but uh, I'm sure you, you know, you've been in other situations where they weren't as uh, diverse as an HBCU. There wasn't. Uh, so with diversity, equity, and inclusion, also known as DEI, being such a budget word right now, we asked our audience a little earlier to give us a definition of DEI, which we'll share a little later in the, uh, towards the end of the interview. But for now, can you please share with us uh, what DEI and ocean sciences uh, means for you? Well, um, DEI, diversity, inclusion, um, or equity and inclusion for me, uh, again, it, it's what's in vogue now in terms of our lexicon and our terminology and language and what have you. But I see myself uh, out of the old EO environment, equal opportunity environment. And so for me, coming up through undergraduate school, for example, um, you know, when uh, we were uh, going through quite a bit of turmoil in this country with regards to rights to education, moving from, you know, uh, something that arose out of the Plessy versus Ferguson a Supreme Court decision about separate but equal, um, separate and equal as far as, um, the races were concerned, education was concerned in particular. And so segregation was legal and, and uh, was the law. And so I went to that historically black college and university because that was the school I could go to, the college I could go to, the higher education that I could obtain. 
there were always exceptions to the rules. Uh, however, um, my coming out of um, that environment and in an environment of equal opportunity of what was going on in the 60s with the civil rights movements, uh, with the new laws that were um, coming in, so to say, lots of legal uh, uh, decisions being made, say from 60, 54 to uh, 65. I was in undergraduate school from 1961 to 65. So what D, E, and I means to me comes out of that kind of uh, environment. And then of course, uh, I went through an era when I was say moving from undergrad to graduate school when affirmative action was in the air, you see and it was being practiced for a couple of decades. Uh, and then we had uh, this language of diversity and inclusion coming in when we were, had various political, um, you know, uh, decisions or movements or going on to move away from focus on equal opportunity. We're an equal opportunity employer to we are a diverse employer. Uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion are important. But under the other, under the law, we had something called protected classes, and we still do. Uh, and that is African Americans, Native Americans, or, or uh, Indigenous Pacific Islanders, uh, Latino or Hispanic Americans, and women. Uh, were viewed as protected classes had been historically discriminated against. And so there were various corrective action policies and procedures uh, that were put in and tried to follow, but you had politically the movement to move away from requiring people to do anything, so to say, uh, by law or keep count of how many of this um, ethnic group or group you have in the workforce, for example, or in the school or wh whatever uh, was being required legally until we moved into this more soft thing called diversity, inclusion and equity, which almost is left up to uh, some moral obligation or the goodness out of one's heart to either uh, participate or not participate or to promote or not promote from, you know, a, well, you, you, you have to do this, this is the law. So any rate for me, diversity, uh, inclusion and equity um, in my simplest form says that uh, is that everyone counts. And that includes these protected classes who are still trying to get their rightful share uh, due to their representation and their being a member of this republic. Uh, and, 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 and of course it does mean uh, that things are not static. And so we do have to be uh, concerned about uh, the, um, how um, um, LGBTQ, I'm not always, um, uh, well, any rate, uh, folks of whether it's gender or um, identity or um, what have you, have to be respected and honored also. Uh, it means that, um, you know, everyone uh, has to, you have to find a way uh, to uh, include uh, or be inclusive. Uh, and, and, um, and, and then there is equity. And that is how do you find policies and procedures and, and administrations and implementation uh, that looks at how far one has to come, for example, uh, or from where they are coming from uh, in order to get their fair share of the pie, so to say, and, and to be respected. Uh, and, and so we, we still have a, a long ways to go when we look in terms of the inequities uh, that exist still in our educational system, system which cripples or, or hinders African-Americans or Black Americans, for example, from 
having all of the uh, necessary uh, preparation and skill sets and whatever uh, at place and in place when they hit the uh, university or the college ground running, you see. We still have those kinds of things that we have to deal with. So to me, that's all part of what uh, diversity, uh, equity and inclusion in the ocean science means as, means as well. Ocean science is, is not a separate and isolated sector or, or part uh, or way of knowing in this world or this country. It is part of the population, it's part of the, the physical features, the, the uh, behavior, the social dynamics of this country and the people who are oceanographers learn what they learn around their breakfast tables or in their families or their communities or their culture, how to see the other in themselves. And, and so um, when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, it means then we've got to um, uh, figure out how do we make sure that those historically underserved, underappreciated, marginalized uh, uh, population and individuals from those populations move to where they have their rightful representation and share of whatever it is that we are, uh, that is part of a, a commons or a public domain. That's uh, fascinating. Uh, Alex, do you wanna take the next question? Hello, Alex. <laughs> hey, Dr. Gerald, it's nice to meet you. Um, so my question is, um, learning about your background and um, your take on DEI, I mean that um, it's <clears throat> making sure that everyone um, is included and they, everyone has the right um, tools from the get-go. Um, how can, I guess my question is, when you first start out in the field, um, and realized that there was a lack of diversity. Um, did you intend to do something about it? Uh, or was there just a natural progression to create a more inclusive space in the ocean science um, as you went along in your career? Well, um, you know, the way I, you know, may try to make an interesting answer to that <laughs> as to did I uh, choose to emphatically do something about that. I would say that, like all of us, uh, there were very, or certainly there were influential figures in my life. And growing up in my household and in my family, um, barring some old terminology, um, my family members, I had family members that were known as race people. My uncle Pat, my father's oldest brother, um, was a starch member of the NAACP, for example. And so my family, you know, instilled in me uh, the importance and sense of social justice and human rights. So in my my, I grew up in a household of teachers, not my father and mother. My father was a seller. My mother was a homemaker, and, but an entrepreneur in which she, uh, or a business person, she sold A-bonds to help have cash flow, uh, you know, at those times. So the family could eat and have shelter and, 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 and clothing and what have you, and, and some quality of life. But so I come out of a social justice and human rights family environment, the kinds of activities that I chose to be part of, or they chose me, whether it was the Boy Scouts, or it was the High Y, you know, or it was the, um, uh, you know, my BTU, the activities at church, um, you name it. So when I, uh, you know, and come in as a, as a child of the civil rights movement, demonstrations, et cetera, all of the horrible things you could think of that could happen on a campus or around civil rights during a segregation era, 
um, when all you could do just about was on campus. So you were constantly trying to push to figure out how do you expand your universe and get what should be rightfully yours and, and, and uh, you know, what have you as a citizen, first class citizen. So although I had my professional interests um, and aspirations, my, uh, my personal uh, interests has always included uh, social justice and uh, human rights. So while I pursued my studies as well as my profession, I always uh, found and looked for opportunities to be engaged in efforts that pushed the front forward for opening the doors for others and lifting as I climbed, so to say, climbed, so to say. So I was always, and maybe it's because I had family members that were the products of HBCUs and some went to other than HBCUs, but I went to an HBCU. So I have always had a connection to HBCUs and doing what I could to help um, uh, uh, disseminate information both ways to HBCUs from HBCUs in that community to the places where I worked or studied. That idea of uh, you know pulling people up along with you is uh, very important. You know, I feel like what's the point of you you know continue to grow if you're not bringing others along with you when you have the opportunity. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Tier, uh, you you also mentioned a little bit about your start with that first question about getting involved with ocean scientists, but uh, you are also the first Black fisheries biologist with a PhD working for the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts you know, a part of NOAA. Uh, so can you tell us a little about, about that experience working as the, uh, working at that facility and just your 40 year career there? Well, again, 40 years is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now that I look back on it, <laughs> but well, uh, I would say first and foremost, um, it was a wonderful experience and it continues to be a wonderful experience. And in many ways, for the very questions that you questions you're asking, and the very last question that you ask, along with the um, a way to pursue what I chose, the direction or the pathway that I wanted to take, um, I always had the opportunity, or I took the opportunity, to stay staunchly engaged, as I said, with working with higher education. And while my starting out at the Northeast Fishery Science Center, um, my first um, uh, title there was uh, Chief of the Fishery Biology Investigation. And that particular investigation, um, and to be short as I can, um, pretty much I was part of the uh, population dynamics um, uh, group or, or division. Uh, and, and the Northeast Fishery Science itself, center itself, while I was uh, located physically at the Woods Hole Laboratory, uh, the center is made up of laboratories from Maine, at that time, Booth Bay Harbor. Uh, there was a, a, in, in a, a lab, it was uh, Massachusetts, uh, and, and uh, then we had uh, labs and we had labs in New Jer uh, in Connecticut, the Milford Laboratory, uh, in um, uh, Sandy Hook, New Jersey, the J.J. Howard Laboratory, uh, and it, at that time it extended down to the Oxford Laboratory in Maryland, um, and and so. Um, uh, the, so the center was made up of several laboratories and the function that I uh, worked with was the um, aging growth unit, which was the primary responsibility that came under the uh, uh, fishery biology investigation, where we handed all production aging for an experimental uh, aging uh, uh, for this center on all of its uh, species 
uh, that it was commercially uh, or, or it was responsible for following the commercial fishery, fisheries and, and, and other fisheries as well, whether it was um, tacit uh, engagement in sport fishing or whatever, or our, uh, and, and then we had our research surveys, uh, et cetera. So what, I'm, uh, what I'd like to say is in that, um, I enjoyed that uh, because my master's degree was a classic of fisheries biology uh, degree, which I got at Oklahoma State University uh, with a research assistantship through the Oklahoma Cooperative Fishery Unit. And so fish was what I wanted to do. And that was one of the, um, uh, I would say, uh, tensions that I had at, when I taught at Lincoln University, as much as I loved Lincoln, and when I taught at Howard University, I love Howard University as an assistant professor teaching something I loved, animal behavior and ecology. Uh, I studied uh, animal behavior um, when I was for my PhD work. And at that time, you know, uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, I would say, heady stuff going on back then. And uh, it was an electrifying time coming out of the 60s and the 70s uh, in terms of my intellectual interests. And um, it was uh, in the air everywhere, so to say, social, political, and intellectual revolution. And so I uh, latched on to um, ethology or the study of animal behavior, which I had been introduced to through, to, through a professor uh, while I was in studying for my master, Dr. Rudolph Miller. And, and so uh, after I toyed with where I was gonna go to grad school, I was looking at Johns Hopkins uh, and uh, Edwin Gould to look, study turtles. I was looking at Colorado with Binky to study uh, fish and George Losey out at the University of Hawaii. And for various reasons, I ended up back my choice at Oklahoma State University. And so um, what I did, uh, you know, there uh, in, um, you know, just, you know, being part of that intellectual curiosity around animal behavior and, and the big person at that time was Nico uh, Tinbergen. Uh, was a leading world ethologist at that time. And so I brought these kinds of attitudes and, and uh, interest and excitement to me to Woods Hole. And so I'd say all that because Woods Hole was trying for me. Um, one, when I got there, nevertheless that I had earned my PhD, like everyone else, I had to earn it. Uh, to be hired by the federal gov the, the, the government, by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, I had to meet all the qualifications. And so I did, but I was living under the air of affirmative action. And so whether it was my perceiving it or thinking it or others, but the perception was that, oh, well, you know, with all that's in the air about affirmative action, the negative stuff that's going on is people being given jobs that aren't qualified or just because they're black or just because they are Latino or just because they're a woman or they're Native American or Pacific Islander or whatever. Um, there was a lot of that going on from my peers as well as my superiors but not everyone. And so I had to sort through all that noise and all that negativity, you see, uh, to be successful and, and why I should have some of the perk assignments so that I would uh, remain upward mobile uh, in employment to the next grade level or the next whatever. And, and so, um, you know, I had to find ways to um, know when to choose my battles, uh, stand up for my principles, fight for what you know was worth fighting for, 
and sometimes just quietly going about with my head down, getting my work done, you see. Um, so, but I enjoyed uh, my, my uh, 40 years. It provided me with travel that I probably would not have had any place uh, uh, had I worked, um, or any place else working. Uh, you know, I got to go across this country. I got to go to visit many of the HBCUs that I wanted to know more about academia and journal, other uh, components of the government. Um, I got to go to conferences annually. I got to participate in my societies that I was interested in. I got to travel abroad. Um, I, I spent, uh, I was tapped uh, to be on the uh, uh, Vice President Gore, Al Gore, uh, Vice President Mbeki for South Africa's Binational bi bi Commission. So I was seconded to uh, South Africa over several years to work with sea fisheries our counterpart, so to say, uh, to the National Marine Fishery Service in South Africa. And I was there to work with them uh, on scientific and uh, corrective action matters. Uh, so I got to visit um, all of the historically uh, disadvantaged uh, college universities in South Africa. Um, and, and, and some non-disadvantaged like Stellenbosch or the or University of Cape Town and bits and roads. But nevertheless, uh, it was a rich experience. I think I made a great contribution. I learned a hell of a lot. Uh, but I also learned in that, that um, some of the things that we were wanting to do on that by National Commission in creating an exchange to help um, uh, with corrective action and bringing uh, educational opportunities to young South Africans at the undergraduate and graduate level, um, we had to ask the question. So I asked the question, what are we doing with our HBCUs back home? What, is our, what does that picture look like? Not in front of South Africans, not to embarrass anyone, but to save us from being embarrassed. And when we started to dig deeper, it was embarrassing. And so then the powers that be, the better heads were convinced that we had work to do back home. And there's an old African proverb that says, beware of naked people who offer you clothing. And here we were naked somewhat and we're here wanting to offer them clothing. And, and so I can say out of that experience, we have now something called the Cooperative Science Centers that operate out of, uh, or administered out of uh, Howard University, out of my alma mater, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, the Living Marine Cooperative Science Center out of Florida a and University. And, and of course they are made up of a constellation of institutions around their various themes. But I say that as something that I've been part of in addition to the Woods Hole Partnership Education Program that I later was part of uh, in the founding of that to bring um, 16 students each summer for a 10 week place based experience uh, in Woods Hole where we have, which is a scientific Mecca uh, it's a little village where big science goes on with the six major science institutions there that deal with ocean, marine, uh, engineering, development, research, education, and what have you. <clears throat> well, Dr. Ambrose, uh, I just want to thank you as a, a early career uh, Black male scientist for uh, being a trailblazer in the ways that you have uh, been for me and many others um, like me. Um, you've been uh, very successful in spearheading so many diversity initiatives. Um, what are some of the tools or resources um, that you would give to people today um, regarding creating successful diversity initiatives 
um, that will benefit that organization and the people of that organization? Well, um, you know, they're both individual and in they're or institutional or group um, dimensions to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I would say welcoming also. And so, uh, you know, what I would say to young people like yourselves, um, I would say um, certainly uh, follow your passions, uh, try to make good on your passions, figure out what you know, is intellectually stimulating to you and, and go for that. You know, like I was saying, when I, you know, latched on to ethology or animal behavior, those were intellectually stimulating times, you know, in, in looking at how you could, I could tie my interest and in my pursuit uh, uh, in practice uh, to a much broader connection uh, or network than just animal behavior. You know, at that time, I can recall uh, we were looking at, uh, you know, there was some indication that the work that Tinbergen was doing, um, you know, around um, in ethology, where it was looking at ritualistic behavior or whatever, how what had come in to um, thinking was uh, autism. And what is it that we could learn from looking at an evolutionary approach to behavior, um, causation, function, um, uh, manifestation uh, that could lend to understanding what was going on in the human brain or in the human body. Uh, and, 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 and so now we hear of intersectional, intersectionality and we hear of interdisciplinary work. I would say that is pro that's exciting to me. And so I would say, take advantage of that uh, in terms of your passion and interest, but in how you connect to others in ensuring that they do not deny you from obtaining your aspirations, your goals and your objectives. And in doing that, how are you lifting others? And in doing that, you wanna look at the laws, the policies, uh, you know, the implementations, of uh, the politics, um, e everything that goes into either opening, retaining, or shutting a door, you see, retaining it where it is, or keeping people in place, or moving um, obstacles and barriers. Uh, and so that means being good at what you're doing, being knowledgeable what you're doing, uh, being uh, compassionate, uh, being respectful, uh, and, and being trustworthy and what have you. Uh, but it also means having the courage to stand up and speak out where it's required uh, and knowing when to hold and when to fold, so to say. I think uh, we have to find a way institutionally or as far as institutions are concerned, when we're looking at institutional racism or structural racism, we're looking at white supremacy, we're looking at all of these social ills um, uh, that, that plague us and that are a crisis right now. Uh, we have got to find a way to break the policy ceiling. Uh, that is still an area where when we're talking about how we're gonna uh, become anti-racist, uh, are we gonna uh, remove these barriers? Are we gonna uh, eradicate uh, structural racism? 
One of the ways we're going to do that is make sure that people from the historically marginalized and underrepresented populations and groups uh, are included uh, is and is is through uh, is at the policy level, and we've got to figure out how to really build what, in my mind, true and functioning and honest collaboration. Collaboration, in my mind, from when I first latched on to what does it mean and how does it speak to me, means changing the rules together. It's not this power dynamic that one gets to set the stage or say what the relationship is. No, we meet as equals, no matter when we talk about equity. You've got to look at where the one needs that stool to stand on to look over that fence, or one can stand on his or her feet and look over. But if the stool is needed, you got to apply the stool, okay, to have equity. And so uh, we've got to work on true collaboration, changing the rules together, figuring out what the resources are to move forward, uh, deciding together what the strategic um, uh, movements will be and aims are and how you're gonna get there and how you're gonna account for all the and keep track of what's happening. And so um, I see that there's a lot of effort right now going on, uh, capitulating to blacks or other uh, groups, biops or uh, to speak up, speak out, and we want to hear you and what have you. I mean, we just had, uh, we cannot escape politics. We had the one and only black Republican center chosen to speak for the uh, Republican party rebuttal to uh, the democratic uh, president. Uh, uh, and, and so, uh, but we have to stop and think about, so what's the advantage there? And is the advantage for all or is it, here's another power play, you see, and somebody gets used in the process and used not for the right reasons to change the way we do things and change for the better, you see. And so um, it, these are the kinds of things we have to have our eyes wide open on, I think. Uh, because, you know, let's face it, people that are in powerful positions are still within the workforce, still looking to retire. They have to protect those positions. And if the pressure is at the time right, they're going to bend so that they get that retirement. But we've got to get folks of biop people who have been pushed away from the workplace, from the scientific bench, from the field, from the community in place so that they can have quality jobs that have benefits that they can look to enjoy while they're working and when they retire and for their family and lift their families uh, in, in terms of attainment as the generations come. You see, the diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion often is about how can I be a better person right now or how can we create this environment where everybody gets alone? But wait a minute, who's there to get alone? We got to make sure that you know there is equal opportunity. That uh, those groups that have been left out uh, historically are in the workplace, and they are in the workplace with good jobs, with good uh, ability to have upward mobility, to to reach uh, their goals and continue to contribute. We, I'm, I'm for uh, training, I'm for education. We've got to have that solid foundation. However, 
we've got to put emphasis on employment. We need black folks, brown folks, yellow folks, red folks, women employed, and we need them employed at all stratas of employment, whatever the employment sector is, okay? In science, in all the sciences, in engineering, in STEM. Uh, and, and so uh, that is exceedingly important from my point of view. And so while we are responding and reacting to this crisis that we're in right now, brought on by George Floyd's murder, and all the other murders that happened before it and after, but his was the tipping point. And, and so we have got to make sure that we do not get caught up in superficial, thin veneer stuff around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we got to talk about the hard stuff of opening jobs, doors for employment. We've got to move remove all of these artificial barriers of you got to walk on water in order to have this position. Those white boys and girls before us or before now and that are in those jobs now, they didn't have to walk on water to have those jobs. So you or I or people who look like us should not have to make it be feel like, oh my God, you got to be all of this and all of that to have that job. You got to have the skill set, foundational skill set, the potential to grow just as they had and do have. Uh, and, and But there's got to be fairness in, in those persons who make the personal decision to employ a person have got to have the courage the integrity uh, to say yes to employing uh, individuals from these underrepresented backgrounds that they have locked out for so long, you see. So this is what I would say has got to happen in, in, in the scientific community, in the STEM community, um, uh, in world, I should say, enterprise, uh, uh, in, in order for us to uh, you know, uh, get on with uh, a fair uh, and open society uh, where all can aspire uh, to meet his or her aspirations. Dr. Joe, I totally agree with you. I, I appreciate you for speaking it real to us. Um, these are definitely things that um, need to happen um, in order to continue um, to continue the momentum that we have, but not also continue the momentum that um, in order for us to um, sort of break through of this um, ceiling that has been placed on us, we definitely need all this uh, facts that you just spoke to us um, need to be mm -hmm. in place. Um, so I just definitely just thank you for speaking that um, speaking that out there in existence. Um, <clears throat> so as we continue on, like we know that you have had a very successful career, and you have your career have done, you have done many great things. But in your opinion, what has been the most rewarding aspect of your career? There again, <laughs> that's a tough one. You guys ask tough questions. Well. Now that I've done it, thank God I have a retirement. <laughs> That's pretty rewarding. <laughs> uh, but as I said, I, I really enjoyed my uh, career. I enjoyed uh, the people I worked with for the most part. And not just for the most part. Most of the people I worked with, I enjoyed working with. They were supportive. They were of all stripes, all backgrounds, and and uh, and and what have you, um, and and so I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed the travel. I really did enjoy that. Now, if I could attach anything to that uh, as a qualifier, 
<laughs> it would have been great if I could have had my family when, with me when I, uh, my spouse, for example, uh, when I, uh, you know, got to travel uh, to enjoy some of these. And then later on we did. And there were, there were times for the um, uh, various society organization meetings where you could pay for something like that uh, for your family member to go. But I enjoyed the travel. I, 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 I have enjoyed the opportunity that it supported me to just meet so many people that are committed to public service or to, you know, just human rights and, and, and social justice, as I said, that was very important to me. And so um, I feel that, um, you know, that was important, but if I get down to the science you know, I enjoyed the opportunity uh, to work here in Woods Hole and to be part of the envisioning and study and examining of that Northwest sliver of the Atlantic Ocean. I enjoyed, I especially enjoyed going to sea um, on the research um, cruises or, or, or surveys. We call them research cruises. Uh, when I was out there, whether it was 14 days, 18, 21 days, or however long it was, all I had to do was think about fish and, and what we were there to do. And on my off time, I could lay in my bunk and read all the books I wanted to. There were no telephones, no whatever. So, I mean, you know, there's so much to being a scientist that, you know, that for each science, there's a, there, there's a uh, bright spot, there's a sweet spot, you know, that, you know, it speaks to just your, your curiosity, your, you know, your, your uh, aspirations and, and what it is you want to do. So, um, uh, I, 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 you know, like I said, that's a hard one, you know, just to nail it, my favorite color, <laughs> I can't <laughs> do it. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed, um, you know, my, um, I, I enjoyed it. And uh, I, I enjoyed the, uh, I enjoyed both the science piece and the education piece, really, I really did. And then there's the outreach piece and that, that was, that was really fun. I think of all of the boys and girls that I got to meet from K through 12 and then through, you know, from undergraduate through graduate and postgraduate and going into classrooms and getting to talk to kids. When my kids, I have a son and a daughter, when they were in school, you know, going into their classes for show and tell and got to talk about being a a fisheries biologist or a marine biologist, you know, and here's what I do. And, you know, here's how you age a fish. And no, oh, you know, you look at the tr trunk and you see the rings on the tree's trunk. And then the analogy, you look at the rings on the scale of a fish or the vertebrae or whatever, you know, all those things were fun, you know? And then there was a the fun part of, uh, you know, just the um, hard part of how much is enough in aging a particular species of fish or a population of fish to come up with an indices to go into a stock assessment, you know, uh, to uh, put out there uh, for those who, the managers that have to look at the dispensation of fish, how many can be caught here and there with this kind of equipment or gear or this time of year uh, if it's males, females, what time are their life cycle, et cetera, if they're juveniles and what have you, what can you catch them with, you know, uh, you know, and what time of the year can you, all those things are just intriguing from my point of view in getting food to the table. And then when you, you know, connect food security to that. And then when I studied in, you know, worked in South Africa, getting, you know, while I, was in fisheries in in in, um, in Oklahoma studying, and 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 I lived here and worked in the uh, in the uh, you know where fisheries got started here at Woods Hole in this country. Um, 
yet I got there and I had a whole new and greater appreciation for subsistent fishing, you know, and what people do on a daily basis to put food on the table, to put food in their children's mouth, their mouths, you know. And, and so uh, it's been exciting. It was and still is. Well, that's just a uh, fantastic, you know, uh, what you said about, you know, Tom being just engrossed in your work. That is, I feel like one of the best feelings you can have, although, you know, you may miss your family sometimes on research cruises and things like that. I feel like it's always special. You can really just, you know, dial in and really focus on the fish and what, and focus on your research out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was our last question. Uh, I think we're getting close to time. So if Tierra wants to come back in, we can try to answer some questions. But, you know, we just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Gerald, for taking the time out of your evening to sit and chat with us today, uh, with us in our community. We thank you. really appreciate all that you do. And as we wrap up, like I said, uh, we first wanted to share a DEI definition from our viewers. And... <laughs> Oh, Tara just came back up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, hey, uh, thank you so much. I was just sitting here just like my heart is so warm <laughs> right now. Like I just, huh, it was just so good to just, first of all, to see black men talking about being in the water, being in fisheries. Um, just your, like, like Alex and Bo Chris said, you are a trailblazer and really made it possible for us to be here today. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so we have um, from our audience, we tweeted out like um, what uh, we put on our social media, what does DEI mean to them? And so we got a response um, from at Jeremy Schreier. Um, DEI to me means recognizing that the system is built with the majority in mind and drastically needs to be rebuilt in a way that is equitable and inclusive to all, especially those not in the majority. So shout out to Ed Jeremy Shire. I don't know if you have any response to that, but that was our um, audience answer. So, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I would say that um, when we look at science, and we look at um, who got to do science and who gets to do science and looking at it um, historically, uh, we know that just about anything that we look at uh, and, and we get to ask questions, why? Uh, you know, there are patterns that we can see at one time, and I would dare say now, uh, when we looked at the workplace, we would have ask or we would observe most clerical secretarial um, positions were held by women. At one time, when we looked in education and looked at elementary education, the teaching staff was women. Uh, if we looked at the principal staff, it was men. Uh, you know, if we look at the clergy, most clergy were men. Uh, if we look at whatever endeavor it is, attorneys, men. Um, Supreme Court, we looked at it, was men. Uh, we look at law enforcement. So what I'm getting at is historically science has been populated by white men. And in the 60s, in the 70s, when we started to, laws were passed uh, to open doors uh, for men, for, for individuals discriminated against, segregated <laughs> against, uh, for women, we started to see some change and if we look in science, even today, if we look at the life sciences, the social sciences, um, 
uh, the, we're going to see a pattern and generally that's where we're going to find most women at all levels, whether it's at the baccalaureate or, mass, or bachelor's or master's or PhD or, and, and posts or, or going into work. Um, if you look at the physical sciences and then even within the physical sciences, you're going to see men. Same as you look at engineering and certain sectors of it and computer science. And so by and large, every sector has been men, but in this country, it's been white men and they still dominate in these uh, uh, spaces. Uh, so that's the picture, but I do not say that, I don't know that I would say that diversity, equity, and inclusion is for them, if I heard that, maybe I misread the question, but what I would say is diversity, equity, inclusion is to change that picture. Now, the tough part about it is how do we go about doing that? And what is the um, commitment to do that? Mm -hmm. And will we stick to uh, changing the waterfront, so to say, where there is representation, fair representation, if we use nothing better than what's the strength of this population, this group or whatever in the overall population. Right now, we come nowhere near our strength as far as our numbers in the general population, you see. And, and so um, that's what we've got to get at is, uh, again, is uh, we've got to open these doors of opportunity relative to education, making sure we close these inequity gaps uh, in education so that young people are, are gotten what they are due and it's morally right as well uh, to get a, 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 a quality education so they can compete. And then they gotta uh, uh, be able to uh, be hired in these uh, jobs uh, and at all levels, the entry level, the mid level, the, the top level and the, the leadership level, levels and at fair representation from my point of view. Uh, so, I mean, those are sort of ideals and what have you, but we've got to move toward that. And but it starts with everybody being prepared, being on their game, uh, knowing uh, the facts and, 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 and knowing how the game is played and not getting sidetracked. Uh, and so I believe if we do our part and prepare and continue to prepare, we continue to fight the battle. That's it. Well, that's definitely a major goal we have here at Black and Marine Science. And I'm just so grateful we can look at you as an example and really move forward. So we are at time, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a great conversation. Make sure that you tune in for our BIMS Bites Kids tomorrow and our BIMS Bites next.